Okay. So that's the chain rule. There's that part. So U prime five. That part. There's that part. Okay, so we put all that together, and now I finally got G prime. I got the one from the derivative of x, and then I've got this term here. And those two guys can come together. The negative three factor in back and five in front. So what is dy dx going to end up being? Well, it's going to be um, the derivative of f evaluated at that original function g. So that's this thing here. Go ahead and place that. So the three in front. Then the extra factor that comes from negative 15 times all of this. What a mess. Uh, but I've still got, so uh, in the end, uh, what can I do to simplify this? Eh, not a whole lot, but I do still have those constant factors. The 3 here that came from x cubed and the negative 15 that came from the uh, application of the second application of the chain, chain rule. So those two guys come together. And then all the rest of this stuff. I can't even do it on one line there. Hey. Yeah, where did that come from? That's not supposed to be there. That was one. Oh, yeah, that 15 cent out front, it's inside, right? So that, that's, uh, yeah, so that was simple form, right? That 15, that didn't come out front. That's, that, that is attached to this term here on the inside of that parenthetical. Yeah, sorry. So I've got a second factor here, it's still multiplication, but the factor, there's where that minus 15 goes, it goes there, not outside. So that can't combine with that other term. Okay, so that's a rather complicated result, uh, again, but um, it did require two applications of the chain rule. This term here is uh, the original f prime evaluated g, and this term here is g prime, where uh, g prime itself, that derivative, had to have another second application of the chain rule to work that work that out. You can't take that one. Now that one is part of a sum. I mean, uh, by the way, oh yeah, that that one there, that's not a factor. That's part of that. It's part of a factor, right? It's an additive term. It's binomial. It no. Uh, this one, I mean, if, this one is inside the parentheses. Right? This one is part of this derivative, right? That whole thing, that whole one is multiplying. I could distribute, uh, I could distribute this, right? Uh, one times this, that would give me one factor. Minus 15 times that, that would give me a second factor. I mean, I could do that, but that's take a whole lot more writing. I'll just leave it in factor form. Um, and, you know, the more times I have to repeat, and the same thing we saw the last time, you know, the more rules we have to apply, the more complicated things get. Um, so, multiple application, or any time I have to combine these rules, things start to uh, compound in complexity. Here's another example of that. It's not very nice looking at all. I would hate to have to use that some kind of application, but uh, how far out should we extend this? That's probably as far as we should go. Keep it as compact as possible. Um, okay. Um, so let's go ahead and do some of the normal things that we do with derivatives. Now that we've got a new rule, we can <coughs> treat more complicated forms. So slopes of tangent lines. It's the usual thing. Um, what's the slope of the tangent line to the curve of the sine squared function 
at the point where x is power 4. Okay, so uh, if I want to find information about a tangent line, what do I have to do? Like derivatives, right? Any information about a tangent line comes from the derivative. Uh, so I'm going to need the derivative of this function, but this is a function of composition. So before I can take the derivative of big F, I've got to identify those two component functions inside and outside. In this case, how does that break down? What's the inside function of composition? Let's start from the inside out. What's the inside function? Sine. And the outside function? X squared. Uh, and again, now it's important to remember what this represents. Right? As I've mentioned already, this is a uh, special notation for the square applied to the sine function. So <coughs> we would normally write that with the parentheses. That makes it more um, uh, transparent that the inner function is the sine function. But even without those, we still should be able to follow that. And then the usual thing, I'll need the two derivatives uh, of these functions. And the derivative of the sine function is what? Okay, now I'm ready. F prime of x is going to be uh, F prime evaluated G. So there's the 2x uh, where that's F prime and the original function G goes in there. So that's the first part of this. That piece there, F prime of G. And then the derivative of G itself becomes a separate factor, cosine x. In fact, I think we did this the other day, I think. I think we did this the other day, but we were still using the um, product rule. We used the product rule to do this last time we did it. But now, I can see that I don't need the product rule anymore. This can be just as easily be handled using the um, chain rule. Uh, and finally, I can actually, now all those parentheses are redundant. This is just 2 sine x cosine x. So the derivative of sine squared is this thing. Um, and what is this thing? That look familiar? It's a double angle formula for sine. So I can actually take it one step further. This is the equivalent of sine of 2x. Uh, so there's an interesting result. The derivative of the square is the function's double angle formula. Hmm. Um, that's actually going to be very helpful for us at some point in the future. Um, so now that I've got it that way, this becomes a pretty trivial exercise. If I had left it in the form of the uh, expanded form, 2 sine cosine, this would have been a little bit more difficult. Um, but now, how do I find the slope of the tangent line? I look at the value of f at the point of tangency and I plug it into the formula. Well, if I'm using this form, the double angle form, then uh, this becomes pretty simple. This becomes sine of pi over 2, which is equal to what? <laughs> 1. Now, if you hadn't recognized that that was the uh, double angle formula for the sine function, then your evaluation would have looked like this. You would have had to have gone through both of these, sine of pi over 4 and cosine of pi over 4. Then you would have had to know what those values are, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2. And then you would have to simplify and see that you end up with the same result. So it really wouldn't have made any difference which way you go. But the evaluation using the double angle formula was much simpler than the evaluation going through the straight derivative. Okay, so there's the usual thing, right? The slope. Now, if I wanted to, um, I didn't ask for it, but I could find the actual equation of the tangent line now. Okay, what's the other question we ask about uh, tangent lines that we've uh, now that we've introduced the idea? Where does a graph have horizontal tangent lines? Okay, let's do that for this one. So in order to answer the question about tangent lines, we need the derivative. The derivative of this function is going to require the chain rule because this is a function of composition. Um, so if I want to break y down, what are my functions? It's 
the inside function. On the outside. And now I've got the negative power. Now, uh, in this case, it's written as a negative power, so I'm going to go ahead and leave it like that. In particular, if I'm applying the derivative laws, I'm going to have to do it that way anyway. If I've got a reciprocal form, then the way that I do the derivative is convert it into its negative into the power form and then apply the derivative process. And this one was already set up with a negative power, so I'll go ahead and leave it. You know, that's the, the usual rule. You, you return the result in the form in which it was presented. This was presented using negative powers, so I'll go ahead and, uh, go ahead and um, preserve that. Okay, so there's my two component functions. Should. Okay, good. Now the right. Yeah. Okay, uh, now derivatives. F prime is what? So the old exponent comes out front, the new exponent is one less. Negative four minus one is negative five. And the other one should be easy. Derivative of g, g is just a polynomial, so what is that going to be? Yeah. <coughs> 3x squared for x cubed, minus 3, the derivative of x is 1, and then the constant goes to 0. Okay, so there are the components all spelled out. So now all I've got to do is plug all that in. And what is uh, the derivative of y going to end up being? Well, uh, I start with the derivative of f evaluated at g. So g goes now into the derivative of f instead of the original f as in the uh, function is defined. So negative 4 out front from the power x cubed minus 3x plus 1, the negative 5, that's the first piece of it. And then uh, the leftover factor that comes from g's derivative. That's this piece here. Okay, there's a derivative. I want to find the equation of the uh, this uh, where the tangent lines are zero. Sorry, where the tangent lines are horizontal. So what do I do? The horizontal tangent lines have a slope of zero. The derivative represents the slope of the tangent line. So whenever this equation is true, that's where I'll find horizontal tangents. And now the question becomes, how do I solve this equation? So, how do I? There's three factors here. Uh, I've got a factor of negative 4. Uh, well, that can be equal to 0, so that doesn't count. I can divide it, divide that one out, or just ignore it through the zero product law. But anyway, that one goes. Then I've got two other factors. Um, and uh, since this is a product, each factor, I'll set each factor to 0 and see what I get. So, what about that first factor? What about this equation? What are the solutions to this equation? How do I solve an equation like that? Now it probably will be helpful to remember what the negative power represents. Right, The negative power represents the reciprocal of the positive power. So uh, let me rewrite this. Okay, does that help? What do you say about the equation now? What values of x will make that true? Let me ask it this way. What has to be true about a fraction before it can be equal to zero? 
The numerator has to be zero. The only way a fraction can be equal to zero is if its numerator is equal to zero. This numerator is fixed. It doesn't depend on the variable. It's not equal to zero to begin with, so there's no way that any substitution for x is going to change that. So this part of the equation has no solutions. It's impossible. If I didn't remember that that negative power represented this reciprocal form and that the numerator of the fraction being zero was the only condition under which a fraction itself can be equal to zero, then I probably didn't, wouldn't see that. <coughs> but that factor, so the four didn't contribute anything because four is fixed, it can't be zero. And the second factor didn't contribute anything. As a reciprocal form, it can't be zero as well. And so in the end, the only thing that really contributes here is that, uh, that last factor. The only thing that really gives me a solution is the last factor. So 3x squared minus 3 equals 0. Now, that I can solve. So where are the solutions? or minus one. So this graph apparently has two horizontal tangent lines. At x equals one and x equals minus one. And I could actually, well, let's go ahead. Let's, go ahead. let's find those points. Let's go ahead. Why not? So what points are those? You know, those are the x-coordinates. How do I find the y-coordinates? Let's plug it in. So that would be minus 1 cubed, 3 times minus 1, plus 1, raised to the negative 4. So what's that? 1 plus 1 is 2. It's negative 1 to the negative 4. Is that equal? Uh, the fourth power, the even power, of course, means it's going to be an even number, but the reciprocal of one is one itself, so that doesn't give us anything new. So there's the first point. This graph has a horizontal tangent line at the point one, one. And uh, where else? Uh, here we've got uh, negative one cubed minus three times negative one plus one to the negative four. So what's going to happen here? That's negative 1 plus 3 plus 1. Is that 3? Is that right? Negative 1. Yep. <coughs> negative 1 plus 3 is 2 plus 1 is 3. Yeah, right. Was that equal? 1 over 3 to the 4th, 1 over 81. So the second point at which this occurs is at the point 1, 1 over 81. So there's the two locations where this graph has horizontal tangent lines. Um, okay. Uh, and finally, uh, we can generalize all of this. These are what we call generalized forms. Uh, for these specific function forms that we've already identified derivatives for. <coughs> uh, it's pretty easy to see how things are going to work themselves out now. Anytime I raise a function using the, uh, a, a, to a power, the old power function kicks in. I still get the power reduced by 1. The old power becomes a multiplier. But I get an extra factor that comes from the derivative of the inner function, of the power the function that's being raised to the power. Uh, for the exponential function, same thing. If I've got e raised to some power besides the x, then I still get e to that power back. That still comes back to me in the same way, but I get an extra factor, the derivative of f itself. Um, same thing here for the sine function. If it's sine of some function, well, I still get cosine from the basic sine formula, but I get an extra factor, f prime, to the chain rule. And for cosine, if I've got cosine of some function of x, I still get minus sine of that same function, 
But there's always the extra factor that gets tacked on that comes from the um, chain rule. So it's very easy to generalize these things, and now we can attack these problems more directly. For example, this function here, the only thing I really have, I don't have to worry about the decomposition now. Um, all of that's going to be accounted for by looking at this as a basic power function. Um, the only thing I really have to identify is what's on the inside. Well, on the inside, I've got this function. And the only thing extra that comes out of the power rule <coughs> is going to come from this function's derivative. The derivative of this function is what? Is that right? Yeah. And so now what happens when I take this derivative? Well, I'm going to look at it basically as an application of the power rule. 10 comes out front as multiplier. All the stuff on the inside now comes under the scope of a new exponent, which is one less than the old exponent. So that's just our basic power rule, ignoring the fact that it wasn't just x is being raised to the power. And then the tack on that comes from the derivative of that inside function. There, that's it. Um, so uh, again, uh, without going through all the details about how this, take, this decomposes, I recognize this as a power form. The power rule is applied, the extra factor from the chain rule. <coughs> Same thing here. E to the 2x plus 1. This is E being raised to a power of some function. So, what's the derivative going to be? Well, all I've got to do is identify the function that is now providing the power of E. So, what's the derivative going to be? Well, if I ignore the fact that 2x plus 1 is not just a variable, uh, it behaves in exactly the same way. E is its own derivative, so that comes back exactly as before. The only thing I get extra is the derivative of that function that was being raised to create the power. What's the derivative of this function? 2. So, in the end, the only th I still got the exact, uh, exactly like I expect for the exponential function. I expect that the derivative will involve the same function I started with, but I get this new factor that comes from that function's derivative. <coughs> and the same for here. Sine of e to the theta. This is a sine function, so I know what's going to happen. The derivative of sine takes me to cosine. I'm still going to get that part of it. That part's still the same. Ignoring the fact that this is not just sine of x, uh, I'm still going to get cosine of whatever I started with. That still comes back like it is. But there's an extra factor that comes from identifying this inner function of composition. This is my function. I guess I would call this f of theta. What's the derivative of f? Same thing, right? There's, there it is. In the simple case, e raised to the variable is its own derivative, so that comes back. So that's the only thing extra I get out of this. I still get cosine through the derivative of sine of the original argument. That comes back to me, but if that original argument is something besides a simple variable, then I have to account for its derivative. That derivative gives me the extra factor. And in the uh, uh, conventional or normal fashion, I would probably put that exponential function in front. Like so. That would probably be the way this would be written in practice. So we looked at enough examples of how the chain rule works to see exactly how to anticipate all these results based on, now some of, there's other cases where things aren't quite so straightforward. Um, you know, those two cases we looked at where we had to apply multiplications of the um, of the um, chain rule or have to actually use the uh, product or quotient rule at some point. Uh, but in this case, that's pretty straightforward. Anytime I can recognize uh, one of these basic function forms being used, then it's obvious how things are going to work out. Whatever law applies to that form is still going to be part of the result, but in every case, I get one extra factor that comes from the derivative of whatever function is taking the place of the simple variable. So there's a list of generalized derivative forms that account for the chain rule and the basic derivative laws for each one of these function types all at one time. So keep that in mind, right? Once you understand exactly how all this fits together, 
then we don't have to go through all that whole process of decomposition and making all those identifications. Once you've done this a few times, I can see exactly how it's going to work out. It's going to work out according to these generalizations. Good. Done. Okay, so uh, that takes care of the chain rule. Are we done here? Yeah, okay, takes care of the chain rule. Uh, we've got two things to talk about on Wednesday. We're going to talk about the logarithm, and we're going to talk about uh, extensions of the derivative in applications. Talk about derivative as rate of change. That will be the cutoff point for test two. So one week from Wednesday is our next test, and that will take us up to the break. So, Okay, have a good rest of the day. See you next time.